Thank you very much for the chance to talk here. I'm actually a veterinary pathologist, and I have an interest in bone pathology and paleopathology, which led me into a very interesting um, group of an investigation of the evolution of morbilli viruses. So it's a very interesting um, connection. And it all got started when I was asked to look and characterize lesions in, pre, in a collection of pre-Columbian dog skeletons. And we don't, most of what we know about um, dog, about the, the Native American dogs came post-contact. And it was part of, you know, after the Columbian exchange. And one of the comments at the time was that some of the Native American dogs were fairly quickly replaced with European dogs. So studying disease, I said, well, was it because of a disease? And an obvious one to look for, which conveniently leaves lesions in teeth, was canine distemper. So I started to investigate that as a possibility. But first, let me tell you a little bit about Morbilli viruses, or just remind you of some of them. They have caused devastating plagues in both humans and animals. Some of the most famous ones are measles, rinderpest in cattle, and canine distemper in dogs. They are very closely related viruses. They're extremely contagious and very fatal in naive populations, and they can have over 90% morbidity and mortality. Measles, rinderpest, and canine distemper, they have a few features in common. They're crowd diseases. You need a lot of animals to maintain these as endemic infections. They start as acute contagious diseases, and what happens if the naive host gets it, it's dead or it's immune, and then they move on. So in order for them to be maintained in a population, they, you need a large number of reservoirs or susceptible hosts. That's why they have evolved into being what they call childhood diseases. And for measles, they know the number. You need about 250,000 people to maintain the virus as an endemic childhood disease. Now, there's been a lot of uh, speculation and studies about, you know, the, we know these viruses are closely related. So the question comes up, which one came first? And if you read some reports, some people will just go, well, canine distemper is the obvious source virus because it jumps species. Measles is pretty host specific. But if you look a little deeper, I would say history and I would include evolutionary history can add some new insights to this story. If you look at the historical record, rinderpest was first described about 3000 BC. It originated in, in Asia epidemics followed the military campaigns, and it was actually the disease that, caused, that started the founding of the first veterinary school in France. Again, there were large epidemics. It spread to Africa in the 1800s, and in, eight, in 1999, there was a vaccine that came out, and the disease was eradicated only in 2011. It's only the second disease ever to be eradicated, second to smallpox. If you look at measles, measles was definitively defined about 900 AD by, um, it wasn't described in the Bible or by the Greeks and Romans, and there was a Persian physician who definitively separated measles from chicken pox from, um, and, and from smallpox. And they've also done some Bayesian um, analysis that suggests that measles and, dis and uh, rinderpest separated around the 11th to 12th centuries. Canine distemper, first described 1742. It was described by a Spanish scientist and colonial administrator who was traveling in Peru, and he made some interesting observations about it. He said it, canine distemper can present with neuroscience, but he said the neuroscience in canine distemper were different than what you saw in rabies, that it was commonly, you saw it in puppies in their first year of life, but if the dogs were covered, they never got it again. These were very, very accurate observations of canine distemper. He mentioned it was common in South America. He had not seen it in Europe was unknown in Europe, and then he also described an epidemic in New Orleans in 1766. 
So if you look at the historical reports from, let's say, 15 to 1800, you can see that rinderpest and measles epidemics are going through. Measles epidemics are pretty common in South America in the 1500s. There's no record of canine distemper until the 1700s, and then you start to see epidemics. And if you look at the history of canine distemper in 18th century Europe, you see a pattern very similar to a new pathogen in a naive population. It first hit Spain in 1760, and there were reports it killed 900 dogs a day. It then spread throughout Europe, and it acted very much like a new disease in a naive population. And then it was also noted that the mortality decreased over time, all features of a new disease. The scientific response at the time, a lot of people were interested in this. They saw the disease, they, they felt the disease had come from South, from South America, from the New World. And they also noted that canine distemper had been common in South America before it showed up in Europe. And then there was a Nobel laureate who said canine distemper came from humans. And he said it, it was a virus that was adapted to humans that jumped to dogs. And oh, by the way, how do you treat it? You give the dogs the blood of their owners. And it turns out that uh, measles virus uh, cross-reacts with, or antibodies to measles cross-reacts to canine distemper. Also, those of you who probably heard of Edward Jenner, you probably didn't know that he wrote a, a paper on canine distemper in 1809. And he, found, he said that canine distemper was now universal, but it had only been described in the middle of the 1700s. It was similar to, in features to measles or smallpox, it was not a new zoonotic disease. And he also tried to use his smallpox vaccine to, to, treat, to, to protect dogs, but it didn't work. So it looks like canine distemper came from South America. So then the question is, is there any paleopathological evidence of canine distemper in these pre-Columbian dogs? And obviously, we don't have a lot of dog remains to look at, but we did have about 132 remains. We found no evidence of enamel erosions. If canine distemper infects young puppies, it causes damage to the, to the enamel organs and leads to um, enamel hyperplasia in dogs. We would expect, based on what we see in unvaccinated populations where canine is, dis is endemic, about a 2 to 20 percent incidence. And obviously, it's negative data. We can't prove it, but it's at least consistent. If you look at the historical record, there's no evidence of canine distemper in the New World. And the, the dogs were brought to the New World in 1493. They were very important. They were named. They were used in war rather gruesomely, as you can see in the picture below. And there was no evidence that they were infected or they died of anything when they got in contact with the native dogs. So if you've got a new world origin for canine distemper, is it human measles virus or rinderpest? They're very closely related viruses. And again, there's very high sequence um, uh, homologies to both rinderpest and measles. And they're also the monoclonal antibodies cross-react. So this means that it's extremely unlikely the canine distemper came over with the dogs when humans migrated into the new world. To have those viruses separated for that long and still so similar is really not likely. The other thing is human measles virus hit the new world in 1530. Rinderpest didn't get to the new world until 1920. So it looks like that measles came from Europe and Canine distemper went back the other way about 1760. So if you look at the evolutionary or ecological factors that might have um, helped facilitate human measles jumping into canines, what were they like in that time? And if you consider the epidemiology of canine distemper, it's a direct contact disease. It is a crowd disease, as I pointed out. And there's been studies saying that the wild packs are too small to really maintain it as an endemic infection. What happens with dogs, and this is a factor in domestication, is they think the dogs came to the garbage dumps. So you then had larger clusters of dogs um, it showing up. And to back that up, there have been studies looking at canine distemper in small populations or villages in Africa. And what they found, they were looking at villages outside the Serengeti because lions were getting canine distemper. And they found the dogs in the large villages 
were maintaining the virus as an endemic infection, but the dogs in the smaller villages were not. So it came through as an epidemic virus, which is a similar pattern to what you see in wildlife. If you look at human and canine migrations to the New World, there are about three waves of migrations. Uh, the debate, the date get, is constantly debated, but it's around 14,000 years ago. In small groups with dogs, there, was, there were not large enough canine populations, even coming with humans at that time, to maintain canine distemper as an endemic infection. If you look at the conditions in 1491, it's estimated that more people lived in the New World than the Old World. Most of the population was in the larger cities in South America, and that there were dogs around these settlements. So there were, what about opportunities for jumping? The arrival of Europeans triggered massive measles epidemics throughout the New World. The morbidity was 100%. It's an incredibly, it's one of the most infectious viruses known, or most contagious viruses known. And it, a lot of times it just completely disrupted the social um, features and there was no one to care for the sick. So, you, and you had dogs around eating the sick. I have a gruesome picture at the bottom showing the conquistador feeding a sick, a sick baby to his dog. Um, so we don't know if it had measles, but it could. So there were opportunities for it to become endemic in dogs because there were large dog populations and in particular in 1541 they were saying they actually had somebody who was getting kicking the dogs out of the churches because they were so common. And then finally we wanted to look at for some molecular evidence and I went to a virologist who said can you find the virus from 500 years ago I said not likely what else could we do? So we looked at codon usage bias, and in, in, in this, there are different codons for each amino acid, but there's a lot of redundancy in the code. So there are more, there are more codes for um, each amino acid, or more than one codon for each amino acid, and each species has a specific bias. So we looked at this, and, and there was a very interesting paper where they were looking at viral adaptation to the host by tying it to codon usage virus, vi bias. And they found that human viruses share a common codon usage with their host, but not, uh, but viruses that infect other mammals don't do this, okay? There is a, also the, the cub is very similar across mammals. So when we actually looked at this, we looked at codon usage bias across all of the canine distemper proteins, and we found that the human codon usage bias was actually showed a higher level of what they call relative adaptiveness compared to either canine or human for all of these proteins. And uh, this is a plug for my postdoc. We, we're now looking at codon usage bias in terms of, of looking at uh, protein expression or how it affects protein expression. And what I want to point out is that if you optimize the canine distemper viral sequence, you know, for all of the proteins, you to either human and, and canine, it increases their um, codon identity. So, in summary, the viruses are closely related. Dogs are carnivores that lived in small groups, so they couldn't have maintained it as an endemic infection pre, um, or unlikely to, pre-domestication. It appears in the record after rinderpest and measles. The paleopath historical and virulence pattern support that it came from the, 16th, from the New World in the 16th to 18th century and spread to the Old World. And again, measles is the most likely one. And the cub analysis suggests that canine um, distemper virus or its ancestor may have infected humans. So I'd like to acknowledge um, the archaeologist who got me looking at these dogs, Jeff Blick, and um, a couple of students that worked on the project, Charles Clearhouse and, and my husband, Frank Michelle. And finally, UGA is a great place to work in addition to being, uh, being a stop code on. And I have to comment about, <laughs> Dr. about Dr. Feinberg's congestion or, or, or comment about our Congressman, Paul Brown. He actually ran, a, he, his main opponent was a write-in candidate named Charles Darwin who got over 5,000 votes. Thank you very much. <laughs>